and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. This is just 73 seconds into the space shuttle Challenger's final flight. The cause of this accident? A thin rubber O-ring, just a quarter of an inch thick, just about the width of a pencil. In the months and years that followed, scientists, engineers, and even ethicists have tried to learn from this disaster. So what actually happened? And how did this change the future of space travel? For centuries, humans have dreamt of going to space, but it wasn't until 1961 that we first left Earth's atmosphere. That first trip was made by a Russian pilot named Yuri Gagarin. But the trip wasn't even that long, just one orbit around the Earth, taking a mere hour and 48 minutes. Today, we have astronauts who spend months at a time living hundreds of miles above our planet. In fact, for the past 20 years, humans have been continuously living aboard the International Space Station. But before we had a home base above our planet, NASA sent astronauts to space on the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions. And by the early 70s, NASA had decided to focus its efforts on a reusable space plane they could bring astronauts into orbit and act as a laboratory. And it paid off because in 1981, astronauts left Earth and soared into orbit aboard the space shuttle Columbia. And for the next 30 years, shuttle missions carried both astronauts and equipment into space, even helping build the International Space Station. Now, leaving our planet has always come with risks, and scientists and engineers do everything they can to minimize those risks. But when things do go wrong, they do their best to learn from their mistakes. Which brings us to January 1986. Barbara Streisand has the number one album in the country and Halley's Comet was just starting its pass of Earth, which we won't see again until 2061. STS-51L was a pretty routine mission as far as flying into space can be. The crew included six astronauts and the very first member of the Teacher in Space program, Krista McAuliffe. The crew was prepared to study Halley's Comet, perform a number of science experiments, and launch two satellites. The entire mission was only going to be six days. By the time the crew boarded the shuttle, schedule changes had already moved their initial launch date months behind. And even by the time they had a launch date, they were another six days behind because of delays to other shuttle missions, bad weather, and equipment problems. All of these delays had NASA administrators impatient to get the mission underway. Which leads us to January 28th, 1986. And liftoff, liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it is clear. High speed photography later revealed that the flight was in trouble from the start. Less than a second into the flight, a puff of dark smoke burst through a joint on the right rocket booster, foreshadowing that in just over a minute, a bigger disaster was coming. To understand what went wrong, let's look at one of the most dangerous parts of any space mission, the rocket launch. When you look at the shuttle on the launch pad, there are a lot of different pieces all strapped together to make up the launch vehicle. First, and probably the most recognizable, is the orbiter. This was the crew's home in space and acted as a floating laboratory. It's attached to an enormous external fuel tank along with two solid rocket boosters. And each of these parts played its own important role in the launch. The orbiter itself had three main engines. The external fuel tank, full of liquid hydrogen and oxygen, powered these engines during launch. But to actually make it off the ground, you need a much bigger push than these engines alone can provide. And that's where the solid rocket boosters come in. These provide 71% of the thrust needed to make it off the ground and get to orbit. They're filled with a solid fuel, which if you were to touch, feels kind of like a rubber eraser. And unlike liquid fuel, which can be shut off with the flick of a switch in the event of an emergency, once these solid fuel rockets are lit, that's it. They can't be shut down or stopped, you are on your way to space. And these rockets are designed to get the shuttle going really fast, over 3,500 miles per hour. So they burn through their fuel in no time, just two minutes. Once their fuel is gone, they're basically dead weight. That's when they separate from the orbiter and parachute into the ocean, where they're recovered and reused by NASA in the future. But back to our rocket launch. The massive external fuel tank continues to provide power to the engines as the orbiter climbs, before it too detaches and mostly disintegrates in our atmosphere. So it takes a lot of energy to make it to orbit. This is because you need to overcome gravity, which is holding you down to Earth, and the increasing potential energy it creates the higher up you go. You see, potential energy is energy stored in a system based on the position of objects in that system. 
It's like a book high up on a bookshelf. The book on the top shelf will release a lot more energy when it falls than a book on the bottom shelf. But mass also affects that potential energy. Imagine if we tossed that book and a refrigerator out of a plane at 3,000 meters at the same time. And for this, let's forget about air resistance. Let's get that air out of there, and now we can just focus on the gravity. So both objects actually land at the same time, because gravity causes them to fall at the same rate. But the refrigerator is going to release way more energy when it hits the ground. That's because it had a greater potential energy because of its mass. We can calculate the potential energy of each object by multiplying its mass times the height it's at times gravity. So the bigger your mass and the higher you go, the greater your potential energy. And for a shuttle launched into space, that number can get really big really fast. So we need to create enough force, which in our case is rocket thrust, to overcome the gravitational potential energy of our shuttle. Otherwise, the rocket wouldn't even make it off the launch pad. On Earth, we could write out this change in potential energy as you move between two heights as the change in gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass times gravity times the height. To use this equation, we will need the mass of the object, which for us is the shuttle and all of its fuel at about 2 million kilograms, though we should note that a lot of this will burn up before it actually gets to orbit. Next, we need the height it's traveling to. For low Earth orbit, this can be around 400 kilometers or about 250 miles. And finally, we need a constant for gravity, which is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And usually, we can assume that gravity's pull on the object stays the same. If you're moving between the ground and the top of a tall building, gravity's pull is pretty much unchanged. But if you're traveling all the way to low Earth orbit, you have to take into account the fact that gravity's pull on an object is going to be stronger down here on Earth than it is farther away. So we have to use a slightly different gravitational constant, and an equation that takes into account the mass of the Earth, the mass of the shuttle, and the change in the distance between the center of mass of both objects. This means our height isn't just the height of the shuttle, it's the height of the shuttle plus the radius of the Earth. So if we plug in our new gravitational constant, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th meters cubed over kilograms seconds squared, and the rest of our values, we'll find that the potential energy of the shuttle all the way up at 400 kilometers is negative 1.16 times 10 to the 14th joules. The energy here is negative because when we're dealing with gravity at these large distances, we set our zero point of height not on the ground, but rather infinitely far from Earth. But we have to find the difference between this potential energy and the potential energy that we started at. To find that, we use the same equation, but now our starting height is just the radius of the Earth. This comes out to be negative 1.24 times 10 to the 14th joules. So the difference between the starting and ending potential energies is about 8 trillion joules. And wow, that's a lot of energy just to get the shuttle to orbiting height. A typical US household uses 3.2 billion joules per month. So this is like powering a home for 208 years. And that's just the energy needed to get it up there. Never mind the energy needed to keep it there. It takes even more kinetic energy to get the shuttle to a velocity where it will stay in a circular orbit around the Earth, which also has to come from that initial launch. Now, the solid rocket boosters were structured a bit like stacked cans full of corn. Engineers knew that when the shuttle lifted off, the massive forces the boosters were under caused the segments to slightly pull away from one another. To compensate for this, rubber O-rings were used to seal the segments and prevent hot gases from leaking out. And these O-rings were huge, 12 feet across. But surprisingly, they were also really thin, only about a quarter of an inch thick. To create a seal, the O-rings had to be both flexible and resilient. They needed to compress when weight was applied to them, but spring back to their normal shape when that pressure was released. But this responsiveness was affected by temperature. And the Challenger launch happened on an unusually cold Florida morning, only 36 degrees Fahrenheit. This was 15 degrees colder than any shuttle launch in NASA history. In fact, the makers of the O-rings were so worried about the low temperatures that they tried to delay the launch, but ultimately they were ignored. To show how temperature affected the O-rings, let's recreate a demonstration performed by physicist Richard Feynman during a televised hearing after the disaster. Feynman took a rubber O-ring, just like this one, that is flexible and resilient at room temperature. He then compressed it in a C-clamp and placed it into a cup of ice water to cool it down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, when we remove it from the water, you can see that the O-ring keeps its shape, at least for a few seconds. 
and that's what ultimately caused the leak to occur on the Challenger. At such cold temperatures, the O-rings simply weren't flexible enough to change their shape and create a seal. So temperature changes the way that rubber behaves because of a property called the glass transition temperature. This is the temperature at which certain materials like polymers become brittle and break just like glass. But the shuttle didn't break apart right away. Scientists believe the chemicals from the fuel may have resealed the hole, at least for a few moments, before strong winds tore it back open. To understand what those chemicals were, let's talk a bit about the fuel inside the booster. The solid rocket boosters were filled with a number of chemicals, including powdered aluminum fuel and ammonium perchlorate, which acts as an oxygen source, because to have fire, you need both fuel and oxygen. Alone, this ammonium perchlorate is just a colorless salt, but combined with combustible materials, it's used to make everything from rockets to fireworks. These were held together by a binder called P-BAN, or polybutadiene acrylonitrile, which also acts as a fuel. When mixed, the reaction creates products including hydrochloric acid, aluminum oxide, water, gases like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, and lots and lots of heat. This heat causes the water vapor and gases to rapidly expand. And this expanding gas has nowhere to go but down out the bottom of the rocket, which then propels the rocket up. It's like letting all the air out of a balloon. The air streaming out the back of the balloon pushes the balloon forward. But because the rocket's O-rings weren't able to create a seal, this energy was able to force its way out through the side of the joint, likely burning up grease, insulation, and even the O-rings themselves, resulting in the black smoke we saw at the beginning. The leak continued to vent hot pressurized gases from the booster onto the main external fuel tank, which contained 390,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and 145,000 gallons of liquid oxygen. But the tank could only take so much heat, and it eventually ruptured in a giant fireball. The solid rocket boosters broke away, beginning to veer off course, but were remotely detonated to prevent them from landing in populated areas. The orbiter was subjected to 20 Gs of force and broke apart, its wings tearing off in the process. The reinforced cabin crew, however, remained intact, plummeting to the ocean below for almost three minutes. The astronauts likely died upon impact. The disaster launched a months-long investigation into the cause of the tragedy. It was determined that bad communication was one of the main reasons why this disaster happened. See, engineers knew that the rings could fail at such low temperatures, but when they tried to raise concerns, they presented this graph to management. Not exactly the easiest thing to read, right? Now instead, look at this chart created by a Yale professor over a decade later. You can see how much easier this data is to read when it's presented in a clear graph. The x-axis is temperature, the y-axis is the number of damaged O-rings, and that big red dot on the left is the prediction of just how likely the O-rings were to fail at those cold Florida morning temperatures. But NASA learned from their mistakes. When the next shuttle launched in September of 1988, it was with redesigned rocket boosters, pressurized suits for the astronauts, new escape devices in case of disaster, and an emphasis on communication. Since the disaster, NASA went on to launch over 100 more shuttle missions. However, in 2003, another tragic accident happened with the breakup of the orbiter Columbia after a piece of foam hit the left wing on ascent, causing a piece of heat shielding to come loose during re-entry, killing all seven astronauts aboard. After 30 years, on July 8, 2011, NASA sent up its final shuttle mission on Atlantis. The program flew 135 missions, with two ending in tragedy. Since then, NASA's astronaut program has focused on sending scientists to the International Space Station instead on Russian Soyuz capsules, and recently on private rockets, like those built by SpaceX and Blue Origin, leaving from American soil for the first time since 2011. And someday, maybe in the not-so-distant future, NASA's looking to send humans even farther into space, traveling beyond Earth's orbit and eventually to Mars. But for that, we're gonna need a really, really big rocket.